We continue our study of the greatest imitator of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the devil himself. So far, we have seen the, uh, the various ways in which the devil imitates the Lord Jesus Christ. And we have also seen that the purpose behind this great imitation is to deceive mankind. Not only unsaved mankind, but even Christians, born again Christians or the people of God. The devil uses his wiles, the devil uses his devices to keep God's people in ignorance and darkness so that they do not see this great imitation and they fall prey to the wiles and the craftiness and the subtlety and the devices of the devil. And the result is great apostasy in the church. The result is that the church remains in an infant state always, never growing into its full potential, never being effective for the Lord Jesus Christ. In these last days that we are living in, in this Laodicean church age especially, the devil has completely deceived most of Christianity all over the world. And he does it in various ways, especially by giving an apostate Bible to Christianity. And the result is apostate Christianity, lukewarm Christianity, a, a church that is not ready to meet the Lord Jesus Christ in the air. That's the condition of the church today. And the reason behind it is the great deception of the devil. The devil convinces even believers to believe his lies instead of believing the book that God has given us, the King James Bible. And of course, he keeps unsaved mankind in blindness by not allowing them to see the truth of the gospel of the grace of God, which can save their souls and give them eternal life. So today we will continue to look at how the devil goes about deceiving mankind and deceiving God's people and how he keeps them in ignorance. We are going to look at today how the devil counterfeits the bride of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says that the church is the bride of the Lord Jesus Christ and the devil imitates even the bride of the Lord Jesus Christ and comes out with his own counterfeit bride. Look at Revelation chapter 21. We will read verses 9 and 10. And there came unto me one of the seven angels which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues and talked with me saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. So here you have the bride of the Lamb. And the bride of the Lamb is a city, and this city is Jerusalem. Now look at what the devil does to imitate the bride of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at Revelation 17, and we are going to read a very long passage. Firstly, we'll read verses 1 to 6, then we'll read verse 9, and then verse 18. And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. While the bride of the Lord Jesus Christ is the holy city, the bride of Satan firstly is called a whore. The bride of Satan is called a whore. Then in verse 2, With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Now, these are the things that the bride of Satan is characterized by. Fornication. Verse 3. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. So this whore is a woman, just as the bride of Jesus Christ is a woman. In fact, Paul says that the bride of Christ is a chaste virgin is a chaste virgin, whereas the bride of Satan is a whore and she is known for her fornication. She is a woman and it says in verse 4, And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. So here you have the colors of the woman. The colors of the woman are purple and scarlet. Those are the colors of the woman. Verse 4, And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, 
and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. So here not only do you have her colors, but you have her jewelry. We are going to try and identify this woman by looking at the description given of this woman in this passage. Her jewelry is gold, precious stones and pearls. Now look at how specific the Holy Spirit is in pointing out so many details about this woman. Then you have the woman's symbol. The symbol is in her hand. It's a golden cup. It's a golden cup in her hand. Now look at verse 5. Verse 5 says, And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. That's her character there. Her character is a mystery. Or in other words, this woman is characterized by mystery. Her name is also given in this passage. Her name is Babylon. Babylon the Great. The description given of this woman is that she is a harlot. This woman is a harlot and she is the mother of all harlots. So these are some of the things that we learn from this passage. But we are going to go ahead and then look at verses 6, 9 and 18 later and see how these verses clearly identify this woman for us. So you have the, the bride of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is a city, which is called a chaste virgin, and the bride of Satan, which is a whore. But this bride of Satan, who is a woman and a whore and a harlot, is also a city. It is also a city. In verse 9, it says, And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Verse 18, and the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. So see how the devil imitates the Lord Jesus Christ. He has his bride which is a city and the devil has his bride which is also a city. But there is a great difference, a gulf between the bride of Christ and the bride of Satan. The bride of Christ is characterized by holiness and the bride of Satan is characterized by by fornication and she is a whore and the mother of all harlots. So we are going to look at a lot of these things that the Bible talks about this great city, the bride of Satan. Firstly, let us begin with the name of this great city. The name is given as Babylon. The word Babylon in the Hebrew language is Babel, Babel. And this word means confusion. This word means confusion in the Hebrew language. Look at Genesis chapter 11 and verse 9. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth. And from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. So the Hebrew word for Babylon, Babel, is confusion. But that was not the original meaning of the word Babylon. Now Babylon is the Greek form of the Semitic word Bab-Eli. Bab-Eli, which means the gate of God. So the original Semitic name of Babylon was Babeli, which means the gate of God. Now why did God change it to Babel? It is very simple when you read Genesis chapters 10 and 11. You clearly understand it. We know that after the flood, Nimrod and his followers rebelled against God. Nimrod being the 13th from Adam, and 13 is the number of rebellion in the Bible, rebelled against God and started once again the worship of the fallen angels and their idols after the flood. So in order to pursue this religion begun by Nimrod, uh, the people of those days started seeking after forbidden secret knowledge of the universe. And they tried to learn the secret knowledge of the universe from the fallen angels or the fallen sons of God. The universe contains many mysteries which God has not revealed to mankind. And for his own reasons, he has not seen it good to reveal to mankind all the mysteries that are there in this universe. So these people who joined the rebellion of Nimrod tried to learn that forbidden knowledge of the mysteries of the universe. They found out that 
that interdimensional travel is possible through gates that are there in this universe, in this world. So the purpose of the Tower of Babel, as your Sunday school teacher may have taught you, was not to build a tower that was so high that it would reach the third heaven. Now that is impossible and it's very foolish to think that those people in those days were attempting to reach the third heaven where God's throne is. That was not their intention at all. They were not fools. They were using that secret forbidden knowledge of science and uh, of the mysteries of the universe to reach a place in the sky, in the first heaven, from where they could access a portal or a gate which would open to them uh, the access to other dimensions. That's exactly what they were trying to do. Secular history tries to tell us that people in those days were dumb, foolish people who did not have the same knowledge of science and technology that we have today. But when you read the Bible, you will see that they were much more advanced in their knowledge of the universe and science and astronomy and so many other things that even today we don't have that same knowledge. And you need to understand that the Bible is hundreds of years ahead of science and technology. Science will take many years to reach up to what the Bible has to teach us. And the Bible tells us that right then in those days, they tried to access those hidden gates, those portals, so that they could travel to other dimensions and do things which God has forbidden them to do. So everything about this religion started by Nimrod and his wife Semiramis had to do with learning the mysteries of the universe. It had to do with learning knowledge that God had forbidden mankind to learn, that God did not reveal to us for his own reasons. Well, the main reason for that would be, of course, that man is fallen and he cannot make good use of all the knowledge that God could give him. So they tried to have the knowledge which probably Adam possessed and they used the wrong way to learn this knowledge that is they tried to learn it from the fallen angels or the sons of God so that was the origin of the Tower of Babel it was erected in order to reach that gate or that portal from where they could travel to other dimensions and this became a religion it was a secret religion and the reason for it being so secret was because Shem was alive in those days. And Shem lived right up till the days of Isaac. And Shem would have established a just rule and reign upon the earth. He would have tried to implement what God had taught him and his fathers before him so that the people who populated the earth after the flood would live righteously before God. But these people who rebelled tried their best not to submit to the authority of God and tried to have their own religion and worship their own gods. The Bible says in the book of Job that in those days, Job lived around the same time as Abraham. In those days, if they would lift up their eyes and look at the moon and kiss it secretly or worship it secretly, that would be an offense that could be judged by the judge. So Shem would have certainly established a rule that the people who populated the earth in those days after the flood should not worship any of God's creation and they should not worship the fallen angels. But you see, the rebellion started by Nimrod did just that. They started worshipping idols. They made idols of, of the things that God created. They made idols of the fallen sons of God and worshipped them in order to gain the secret knowledge. So for this reason, they had to keep everything under cover. They had to be very secretive about everything they did. And there was a mystery involved in all that they did in this religion. Now, the most simple way they could do it was every word they used in their religion would have a double meaning. The normal people would understand the same word in a certain way, but the initiates would understand it in another way. So you see, mystery was involved. It was very secretive, this religion started by Nimrod, uh, in which they tried their best to go against the natural laws that God had established for mankind in this world. So that is the name Babylon. Babylon is the origin of all rebellion against God after the flood. 
But there is also the character of this Babylon mentioned in the passage that we have read. Babylon, as I've said, is characterized by mystery. And I've already explained that to you. That everything they did had to be kept under covers because they did not want the judges or the rulers to find out that they were doing this forbidden thing, seeking forbidden knowledge and rebelling against God. They didn't want them to know that they were worshipping other gods than the one true God who created all things in this universe and the God who had destroyed the earth with a flood. The God of Noah, the God of Shem, Ham and Japheth. They didn't want them to know that, so they kept everything under cover. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 7. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let, until he be taken out of the way. So, this is called the mystery of iniquity. Again, this is in opposition to the mystery of godliness, which is God manifest in the flesh. If God has the mystery of godliness, the devil has the mystery of iniquity. And so, Everything to do with Babylon was mystery and it was not good mysteries like we the church have been given the mysteries of God. It's not like that. These are the mysteries of iniquity. It's to do with sin and rebellion against God. The kingdom of heaven that was prophesied in the Old Testament. Remember that the kingdom of heaven is the main theme of the Old Testament. The kingdom of heaven that was prophesied in the Old Testament, that was preached by Jesus Christ, John the Baptist, went into a spiritual or a mystery form in the church age. Now this is the Old Testament here, and that is the church age. In the Old Testament, the kingdom of heaven is a literal kingdom. It's a literal kingdom, whereas in the New Testament, it becomes the kingdom the kingdom of God the kingdom of God which is a mystery or a spiritual kingdom just as the kingdom of heaven goes into mystery form in the New Testament the devil's kingdom of Babylon which was literal in those days imitates the kingdom of God and goes into mystery form in the church age and we see it as the Roman Catholic Church in the church age. How can I say that? Look at the description given by the Lord, by the Holy Spirit in the scriptures. Look at the colors of the woman. It is purple and scarlet. You can look at the pictures of the Roman Catholic cardinals and popes and you will see that that's the color of their clothes. They always are wearing clothes whose colors are purple and scarlet. Look at the jewelry worn by the cardinals and the pope. Gold, precious stones and pearls. They are decked with these kind of jewelry. Look at the symbol. We are going to come to that as well. So it's very clear that the Babylon of the Old Testament, which went into mystery form, is none other than the Roman Catholic Church in this age that we are living in. Now the Bible in the book of Revelation in chapters 2 and 3 clearly outlines the history of the church age for us. Revelation chapters 2 and 3 are prophetic in nature and they give us a picture of the whole church age from the first century till the rapture of the church. We find that Ephesus, the first church to which the Lord writes a letter, is the church that was there from around 100 AD to 150 AD. That's the first period, Ephesus. Then after that, you have the second church period, which is Smyrna up to 325 AD. And then from 325 AD to 500 AD, you have Pergamos. And this is the church that we would be looking at a little bit closely, the church of Pergamos. From 500 to 1000, you have Thyatira to up till 1000 AD. From 1000 AD to... 1500 AD, you have Sardis. From 1500 to 1900, you have the Church of Philadelphia, which is the greatest church or the greatest church age, which produced the King James Bible. And then finally, from 1900 till the rapture of the church, 
you have the Laodicean church. This is how the Bible outlines the history of the church after the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. The church age is divided into seven periods of time. And each church symbolizes that church period. Now Pergamos, the word Pergamos means much marriage. And it also stood for the civil rights of the people. That is the church of Pergamos. It was a church which was married to the world. What happened in the Pergamos church age from 325 AD onwards is that in the Council of Nicaea, the Roman Emperor Constantine the Great brought together the religions of Rome and mixed them with the Christianity that was existing in those days in Rome. So the result of this marriage between the religions of Rome and Christianity was the Roman Catholic Church. Now, we don't need to go much into detail about the subject, but you can look up any good church history book, not the ones that are written in favor of the Roman Catholic Church, but the ones that truly expose the false church, which is the Roman Catholic Church, and which uh, talk about the history of the true church of the Lord Jesus Christ. So here you have the church of Pergamos, from 325 to 580 and it was during this time that the Roman Catholic Church came into existence. Now the seeds of apostasy and false teachings were sown much earlier than that. They were sown even in the days of the apostles. You remember how the apostle John talks about antichrists and those who deny that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. So the, the, the seeds of false doctrines and apostasy were sown in the early days itself. But it started growing in the Pergamos church age. The church did not become better and better as the years went by. The church became worse and worse. Remember the Ephesus, the church of Ephesus, the very first church period, the Lord Jesus Christ accused it of falling away from its first love, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. The church of Smyrna, of course, was the persecuted church. But the church of Pergamos, the Lord had a lot to say about this church. They had those who taught the doctrine of Balaam. They had those who taught the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. That is nothing but the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church that the clergy are above the laity. That's where the word Nicolaitans comes from. It is a word which means to conquer the laity. Nico or Nikao means to conquer. And Laos, the people, the common people. So Nicolaitans were those who said that the clergy, the priests, were above the common people and the common people had to submit to them. And the Roman Catholic Church, which began at this time, continued to grow and it grew in its main character and that was mystery. It became more and more mysterious as the days went by. Look at what the Lord said to this church in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 13. I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. And thou holdest fast my name and hast not denied my faith. Even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. So here he talks about Satan's seat. Satan's seat. What was this seat? You see, the Satan's seat originally was here in Babylon. That is nothing but the Babylonian mystery religion and uh, the main people in this religion were the priests, the priests of the Babylonian mystery religion. So the original seat of Satan was in Babylon, the Babylonian priesthood, and it was there till after the days of Nebuchadnezzar when the Medes and the Persians and the Cyrus and Darius occupied Babylon and uh, then at that time, the seat of Satan was removed from Babylon and taken to Pergamos in Asia Minor. So Satan's seat was here in Asia Minor. In the days of John, it was there in Pergamos. It was there in Pergamos. And it came from Babylon. Remember this. The seat of Satan was in Babylon till the days of Cyrus and Darius. And after that, it was removed from Babylon and taken to Pergamos in Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey. So here you have 
John writing to the church of Pergamos, the words of the Lord Jesus Christ and says, I know where you dwell, where Satan's seat is. That means the Babylonian religion and the Babylonian priesthood made Pergamos its main city from which they would practice their mystery religion. But from Asia Minor later on, this Babylonian religion and the Babylonian priesthood moved to Italy. When the Etruscans moved from that area near Pergamos and went to Italy, they took the Babylonian priesthood and the Babylonian religion and Satan's seat, which is not a physical seat, by the way, don't get confused. It is not a literal seat, but it means the, the place where the religion was situated at that point of time. So Satan's seat was taken from Asia Minor by the Etruscans and taken to Italy, to Rome. And since the Roman religion has its roots in Babylon, they readily welcomed this Babylonian religion and they made it a part of their own religion and they accepted the Babylonian priesthood as their own. And what they did was that according to their religion, the civil ruler of the city was also the high priest of the Babylonian religion. That's why Julius Caesar was crowned not only as emperor of Rome, but he was also the high priest of this Babylonian religion. He was also the pontiff, the, the pontifex maximus and the pontiff of Rome as well as the Babylonian religion. Now keep this in mind because this is very important for you to understand. So you need to understand this. Just as the Babylonian religion spread to all places on the earth, it also came to Rome and there the Roman Pontifex Maximus was also the priest, the high priest of this Babylonian religion. But Rome fell. Rome fell about two or three hundred years after Christ. About three hundred years after Christ. And once Rome fell, the, the religion of Rome and the Christianity that was there in Rome were mixed together by Constantine the Great, as I've said in around 325 AD. And the result of that was the Roman Catholic Church, which is a mystery church because it's a mixture of the Babylonian mystery religion and Christianity and Gnosticism and a lot of other things. And the result is this great whore, the mother of harlots, in a new form, the Roman Catholic Church. Brethren, I need you to understand this, that the Babylonian religion of the Old Testament morphed itself into the Roman Catholic Church. You study the Roman Catholic Church, you study its beliefs, its, its practices, its origin, its leadership, and you will see that it is nothing but the Babylonian mystery religion in a new garb. That is all. That is the Roman Catholic Church. Now look at the cup or the symbol of this great whore. The symbol of this great whore is a golden cup in her hand. In the ancient Babylonian religion, before a person could be initiated into the mystery religion, he had to drink some mysterious beverages concocted by the priests. And they would drink those beverages which were intoxicating in nature. And once they were intoxicated, that was when the priests and the other teachers of the Babylonian religion could teach them the mysteries and the secrets of their religion. Once their understanding was dimmed, once the person was in their control. Of course, confession to the priest was a major part of the Babylonian religion. When a person confessed all his faults and his sins and uh, all the mistakes that he has done, he would be in the hands of his confessor. So they could blackmail that person and make sure he did not go out and reveal all their secrets. So that's how they worked in the mystery Babylonian religion. They made them to drink of this mysterious beverage. N nobody knows how they made that beverage, but they made it in such a way that the person who drinks it would get intoxicated and they would be completely in their power at that time. Now look at what the Bible says about this golden cup in Jeremiah 51 and verse 7. Babylon had been a golden cup in the Lord's hand that made all the earth drunken. The nations have drunken of her wine, therefore the nations are mad. Babylon 
is a golden cup in the Lord's hand. So Babylon is connected with a golden cup even in the Old Testament. And in the New Testament we have already seen that the woman uh, who is sitting on the scarlet colored beast has a golden cup in her hand. So once these people got intoxicated, the priests would bring them into their control. So the Babylonian religion was associated with a cup. Even in the scriptures, as we have seen, God says, Babylon is a golden cup in the Lord's hand. But in 1826, interestingly, the Roman Catholic Church struck a medal. And on the medal was the image of a woman. But what is interesting is that the, the woman had a golden cup in her right hand. And there was an inscription there on that medal. It said, the whole world is her seat. Look at that. The Catholic Church itself is identifying itself with the woman of Revelation chapter 17. The whole world is her seed. That was the inscription written upon that medal. And the woman had a golden cup in her hand. Now with this we understand that the Roman Catholic Church is also characterized by mystery. Like I've said in the beginning, the ba in the Babylonian religion they would have a double meaning for a word. So that the initiates would understand it in a certain way and the non-initiates would understand it in another way. So that they could keep their secrets uh, from the eyes of the public. And that's exactly how the Roman Catholic Church works today. For everything they do, they have a secretive nature to it. There is a lot of mystery attached to the Roman Catholic Church. Take for example, they will not allow you to walk into the Vatican Library. Why is it? Everything about that library is a mystery. They will allow you to look at a few books, but all the other secret books are hidden somewhere in the walls in the Vatican Library. Same with all the other things that, has to, that have to do with the Vatican Church. It's all a mystery. They will never be transparent. They will never tell you all the things that happen in the Vatican Church. It is because it is the Babylonian mystery religion. So when they struck the medal and they said the whole world is a seat and there you have a woman with a golden cup. The initiate would understand that it's a reference to the Babylonian religion but generally Christians would think oh it's just a symbol of the Roman Catholic Church but they're very subtle in the way they hide the truth from the eyes of other Christians so you have the colors the jewelry the character the name and the symbol and now you have the description the description of this woman in Revelation 17 Babylon is called the mother of harlots and abominations. There are two reasons why she is called that. Firstly, because of idolatry. Because of the idolatry that was there in Babylon of old and Babylon of the present times. So it is a spiritual harlotry. It's a spiritual prostitution. Going away from the one true living God and worshipping idols instead of worshipping him. But secondly, it was also called the mother of all harlots because of the prostitution that was instituted as a part of the Babylonian religion. Semiramis introduced temple prostitution as it is found later on in so many other religions. Temple prostitution was uh, started in the Babylonian religion by Semiramis the wife of Nimrod and because of this and because of these two reasons the Bible calls the woman of Revelation 17 the mother of all harlots idolatry and spiritual harlotry and also because there was literal prostitution going on in the Babylonian religion so the, the Catholic Church is also in many ways just like the Babylon of the Old Testament times. Look at all the idolatry that exists in the Catholic religion. They have the image of Peter, they say, but that is really the image of Jupiter. And they say they have the image of Mary, which is nothing but the image of Semiramis herself. Then they have, of course, the child in the hands of Mary. Who is that child? It's not Jesus Christ that they are worshipping in the form of an idol. They are worshipping Horus, the son of Osiris and Isis of uh, the Egyptian pantheon. 
That's what they are doing. Their religion is mystery. To the uninitiated, it looks like they have the idols of uh, Peter or Joseph and Mary and Jesus Christ. But to the initiated and to those who know the secrets of this religion, it is very clear that these are the idols of pagan gods of the Babylonian religion. That's why it's very important for you to understand the mystery form of the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church is a continuation of Babylon, the great of the Old Testament times. Now this is how the Babylonian religion spread. It started in Babylon and from there it went to Egypt. From there it went to Greece. And there, from there it went to Rome. And as I've said, after about 300 years after Christ, it became the Roman Catholic Church. It went into mystery form. In other words, Imperial Rome, the kingdom of the devil in those days, Imperial Rome morphed into a, a, a spiritual kingdom. Just like the kingdom of heaven became the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Rome became spiritual in nature and became the Roman Catholic Church.